everyone. Welcome back to the And God Said podcast. I am your host, as you know, Reverend Kimberly Constant. And as you also probably know already, this podcast is offered in conjunction with an online Bible study I teach called Cover to Cover, in which we read and study every single book of the Bible. And we are into Philippians today. So we have moved almost through the entire entirety of scripture, but it's never too late to join us. You can find more information on my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. We'd love to have you, even if it's just for these last few weeks. You can also sign up for the newsletter and that will keep you informed of further offerings. I plan on doing a study this summer and offering some other chances for community And then definitely we'll do something again in the fall. So that way you can stay connected to us. But you're also welcome just to be here for the podcast. And I recognize that some people are moving a little more slow. And so you'll be listening to this way after the fact. So, so glad you're here, whatever brought you here. And especially excited for today's episode, which is on the book of Philippians. One of my favorites. It's a book about joy. And boy, don't we always need more of that. So let's dive in. I've titled this episode, Joy. So in terms of authorship and dating, uh, it's Paul and Timothy. He identifies Timothy as his co-author. It's probably Paul writing the majority of it, uh, but you know, maybe Timothy sitting alongside him or offering some commentary or even doing some of the scribe work for him. Uh, they, he describes both himself and Timothy as servants of Christ Jesus. Now, we've been looking at what, how Paul introduces himself in his letters because it is significant. And notice here in Philippians, he does not mention his apostleship. This is, we assume, because he didn't need to. This is a church with whom he is very close, as we see from his language. These are his good friends. He doesn't need to convince them of his authority. For once, he doesn't have to go on the defensive, uh, you know, trying to testify to all the things that make him a worthy uh, teacher of the gospel. They have a good relationship, and so he can just call himself a servant of Christ Jesus. The dating is somewhere around 60 to 61 AD while Paul was in prison. So Philippi was one of the stops along the route that connected Rome with the east. It had been established as a military outpost by Emperor Octavian, and it's in, of course, the region of modern-day Greece, and it became an important municipality after that time. It was inhabited by a mixed population of people, by Romans, a large population of Macedonian Greeks, which makes sense because that's where it is, and a smaller population of Jewish people. And the people of Philippi enjoyed the highest of Roman privileges. They were proud of their city and of their citizenship. And here, if you're able to view this presentation, you can see a map of where it is located in the region of modern day Greece. So Paul first set foot in Philippi around 50 AD on his second missionary journey. And if you remember from the story in Acts, he ends up in Philippi because he has that vision of a man from Macedonia. Remember that he wanted to go in a different direction and then he has this vision of this man calling him to the region of Philippi And so Paul is faithful to that call and he goes, but he's disappointed because this was not his plan. It was a deviation in what he wanted to do. But when he arrived at Philippi, he met a woman named Lydia and some other women that were gathered by the river, uh, having their own kind of worship service, if you will. Um, Probably they knew something of Judaism at the time. They weren't welcomed into the temple perhaps, but they were um, sympathizers with Judaism. They knew something of God. Uh, These people are often called God-fearers. So they had some sort of relationship and faith, but they hadn't been fully accepted into the Jewish community. So they were meeting by the river. Paul finds them there, preaches to them, and they become Christians. And Lydia and those women become the nucleus of the Philippian church. And the church did meet in Lydia's home. She was quite a prosperous woman. And it was a prosperous church, as we see in this letter, because they send gifts to Paul and seem to be supporting him financially as well as, uh, you know, as friends. 
It is believed that Lydia and some of the other women were indeed the leaders of the Philippian church and that in general, women performed many leadership roles within this body of worshipers. Uh, Paul lists two women, Eudodia and Syntyche, and he describes them as women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. He also seems to intimate that there's some kind of beef between these two ladies and that he's calling for them to have unity and faith. So Philippi was also the location of the jailer. Remember that story, Paul and Silas were imprisoned and the jailer came to believe, invited Paul and Silas into his home, cared for his wounds, and the jailer and his entire household became Christians as well. So he had some really fruitful (laughs) interactions in a place where he did not originally want to go. After a while, the magistrates of the city did ask Paul to leave. They really actually more like forced him to leave. Uh, But the Philippian believers continued to support Paul. They upheld him, as I said, with financial help, as well as with their prayers and friendship. After his time in Philippi and the surrounding region, Paul was quite depressed. He believed that he had failed in his mission because, again, he hadn't been able to do what he wanted to. He had been you know, the door was shut and he had had a window open to send him to this region. And because he was sent off with um, the magistrates, forced him out of Philippi and then out of, you know, the same thing happened in the other towns, he felt like he had somehow failed. Yet these churches turn out to be some of the strongest. And certainly we see that in his relationship with the Philippians. So the purpose of writing this perhaps is the most personal of Paul's letters. He uses the singular personal pronouns 51 times, and he really reveals his heart to the people. So this has a couple of purposes. It's a thank you note, really, to the Philippians because they sent money to support Paul and his missionary work. They sent gifts as well. They supported him with prayers and friendship. We find that they even sent uh, Epaphras, Epaphroditus to be with him and minister to him. So they have been such good friends. And so he's writing to thank them for that. But we also get the benefit of getting to hear a little bit of Paul's heart. He reveals his hopes, his convictions, his anxiety. And ultimately, the confidence he has in Christ to overcome everything. You really see that here. You also see through some of his language that he's, I think, a bit concerned, (laughs) rightfully so. He's in prison. He's about to face trial in Rome. And I think he wasn't sure if he was going to survive that, if he was going to be found guilty and sentenced to death or not. And you can see that in this letter where he kind of has that language of, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And at the one hand, he's confident and kind of longing for Jesus. And on the other hand, he's longing to continue his ministry on earth. So you really see so much of Paul's heart, which is why I like this letter so much. So in terms of structure, this is a pretty short letter, but we can um, discern a structure to it. So he begins, as he always does, with a greeting. Here we have a thanksgiving as well as a prayer. Then the first segment is sort of joy and hardship, and it's his example. And we've seen this in Paul, where he offers up his own life as an example. Then he's going to move into joy and hardship as exhortation, kind of imploring with the Philippians to, to follow him as he follows Christ and to find joy in hardship as well. And then the last segment is joy and unity, kind of moving forward. How do you move forward in faith? Uh, despite the things that might be going on. And then, of course, we have his conclusion. So in terms of the greeting and thanksgiving and prayer, this is in the first 11 verses. Paul expresses his joy and thanksgiving for the partnership of the Philippian believers. Their support has been steadfast, whether Paul is in chains or whether he's preaching free. And this is huge because we've seen in his other letters that he has a lot of opponents (laughs) Uh, who are saying, well, he's in prison, so he must not really be an apostle, or he must not have authority, or maybe he's actually preaching a wrong gospel. And the Philippians have never wavered in their support of Paul, and he's so grateful for that. So he uses language like, I always pray with joy. I have you in my heart. I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And all of these terms indicate the intimacy Paul has with his community. 
truly, I think we could say that these people have become more than just, you know, a church that he's planted, but they've become his dear friends. And so his prayer, it's so beautiful what he prays for them. And this is one, you know, you can take scripture and make it your own and pray it as well. Uh, it starts in verse nine and he says, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What a beautiful prayer. Write that down somewhere, highlight it in your Bible. Pray that over the people that you love, over your friends, over the people that you care about. Uh, that's just a wonderful prayer. We can take it right from Paul's words. So then he turns to this concept of joy and joy specifically in hardship. And so we've seen, as I've said, Paul uses his own circumstances often as an example, and he does so here as well. And he writes of the joy that has come from his suffering. And so he says, yes, I've been in chains, but he writes, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Why does he say that? Well, because others have stepped up to proclaim the gospel. And we were actually talking about this in one of my discussion groups last week. Last week, when we were talking about spiritual fruit and the fact that, you know, there's people, I would say me, <laughs> me, I'm an achiever. I like to check boxes and get things done. And sometimes I have to remind myself to, you know, focus on the giftings that God has given me and invite other people in to exercise their spiritual gifts. Because when we watch someone live into their gifting, it's a beautiful and amazing thing and it strengthens our faith and it strengthens the faith of everybody. So to be able to take a step back and realize the gospel will go on, uh, the church is going to go on, even if I'm ill or like Paul in prison, God forbid, or just unable to fulfill, you know, what we think of as our duties to the body of Christ. There are other people that can take up that charge for us. And it's meant to be that way. Uh, it's, the gospel advancing is not dependent on any single one of us or even any single one church. It's dependent on all of us working together. And so Paul sees that, and I think it gives him comfort as he awaits this unknown fate that no matter what happens, Paul knows the gospel will be preached. Uh, and so he acknowledges also, this is so interesting, that not all of the teachers have had good motivations. In fact, some, from the way he talks, sound like they're pretty selfish. Nevertheless, and I love what he says here, uh, in 118, he says, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And I love this because we know we are dusty human beings. And certainly in our modern age, we unfortunately have seen some of the great leaders of the Big C Church fall. Um, there's been scandals in leadership. There almost always are. There, uh, people have stepped down, all sorts of things going on among Christian leadership and, of course, among us as people as well. We are not perfect people. We are dusty and limited, and so we do make mistakes. We do sin. It's part of the faith journey, and, and things go wrong. But... Um, it's okay because Christ is still being preached. So sometimes people wonder, well, if I came to faith through someone who later got caught up in some big scandal, like what does that mean for me? Or what does that mean that a whole church was led by a pastor who had to step down because he had some sort of uh, perhaps, you know, sexual infidelity or something and he, he left in, in sort of shame. What does that mean for the congregation? Well, God can do anything and he can work through anyone and he works through imperfect people. And so we evaluate the message, the words being said. And if Christ is being preached, even if it's through an imperfect person, it's still a good thing and a cause for rejoicing. And I like that. It's a very mature point of view. Uh, so he also acknowledges that the prayer and support of the Philippians have helped and will continue to help him to have courage for whatever lies ahead, whether that's life or death. And here he adds that he's torn. He says he longs to be with Jesus, 
but he thinks he's going to survive because he still has so much to offer the people. I think he still felt like he had a lot to do in his ministry. And he said, so I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So he's like a father <laughs> fawning over his children, wanting the, these churches that he's planted to do well, wanting to leave them in a good place. And, and I think sensing that his time is not quite up yet, although he admits that when that time comes, he's going to be okay and at peace because he knows he's going to see Jesus. So then he turns to his exhortation for the Philippians. So we're still with, you know, the overarching theme of joy and hardship, but now he's going to call them to action. And so it, this begins in uh, 127. He says, whatever happens, and he means whatever happens to him, if he lives or dies, you conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So it appears that he then launches into some exhortation due to reports that there are opponents who have set themselves against the Philippians. And this makes sense. They are close with Paul. They are probably intimating Paul in every way. They're supporting him. And we know that Paul has plenty of opponents. So it makes sense that those same opponents might turn on the Philippians too. Uh, he says in 129 through 30, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So they are going through the same struggles as Paul, which I think is attacks from all sorts of different opponents we're going to see here in a minute, who are really trying to derail what is happening in the Philippian church. So who are these opponents? There's probably multiple groups. Two big ones stand out. The first kind of grouping is other Christians or other brothers and sisters or followers on the way or believers, whatever you want to call them at this point, but those who opposed Paul's leadership. And we know that that group exists. We saw him talk about it in his letter to the Corinthians. So more than likely, uh, this group of opposers viewed Paul's suffering as indicative of weak faith and an inability to grasp the true power of Christ. We've seen that, where people say, look at Paul's suffering, he's in jail, he must not truly be an apostle, he must not really have access to the power of Jesus, and maybe he's not even teaching us the right thing, because if he was, he would not be in jail, uh, he would not be suffering. But we know that that's not true, and Paul will say, it's because of my suffering that I have all the credibility in the world. The suffering links me to Jesus, who suffered for our behalf. Uh, so we have that group, Christians who are just mistrustful of Paul because of his suffering. And then you also have the Christian uh, Judaizers. These are the people who are trying to hold on to the ways of the Old Testament, the Jewish law, and have faith in Christ. So they are Christians, they're believers, but they're the ones that are arguing, well, maybe we should all be circumcised and follow the food tableship fellowship laws. Um, and so they, those people are called Judaizers. And certainly we've seen Paul confront that argument as well in his letters. So that's one group. But this that group is still believers. Paul refers to them as brothers. So even though they're opponents, he's not, you know, he recognizes that they're still part of the family of faith. Then you have the other group, which Paul kind of refers to as uh, some pretty strong language. I don't want to misquote him, but I, let me see if I can find it. Something like, I think he calls them dogs even, maybe. I mean, he has some strong, yes, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. So in this category, he's talking about Jewish missionaries. So they had tried to infiltrate some of the Christian churches and lure the people away from faith in Christ and try to get them to turn to Judaism. So they would proclaim that righteousness and perfection were attainable here and now only if one submitted to circumcision and the ritual law of the Old Testament. So they tried to, as I said, persuade the Christians to become Jewish rather than follow Jesus. And these Paul really had harsh words for because um, they were quite vociferous. They were really uh, frenzied about it. They, it's not like they were kind of gently 
coming in and, and giving their message. They were full on attacking the church and trying to, to lure people away. And so Paul was quite mad at them. So Paul says uh, to the Philippians, be like-minded, unified, Christ-centered, rather than selfish or vain, humble and self-sacrificing. Uh, this, you know, is the example Paul tries to set, but it is absolutely the example that Christ Jesus perfectly fulfilled. And so as he's calling for them to do these things, it is in this context of you're, you're, you're suffering as well. You're suffering as I've suffered. You're being called into question for your faith. You're being attacked from all sides, both from within the church and without the church. Hang in there. Be like-minded. Be unified. Focus on Christ. Be humble and self-sacrificing. Keep doing the discipleship thing, and it's going to be okay. And so he includes in this section one of the earliest Christian hymns. And this is Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. And it's a beautiful hymn that really lays out what Jesus has done. So let's read it. Um, so starting in Philippians 2, verse 6, the hymn goes, He's talking about Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he, being Jesus, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. This letter is short. There are some amazing verses in here and that, that hymn is one of them. And again, this just goes back to Paul's argument. Suffering is not an indication of weak faith or wrong faith. Suffering connects us to Jesus because he humbled himself to suffer for our sake. And because of that, God exalted him above every other name. And guess what? That's our inheritance too. We are going to suffer as Christians. We will. We live in a dusty and broken world. We're going to suffer as all people do. And then we're also going to suffer, particularly as Christians, when people don't like us, don't agree with us, heap insults upon us because we follow Jesus. But we too will be exalted. We will be raised from the dead into newness of life and sparkly resurrection bodies where we get to live in perfect peace and harmony with God forever and ever and ever. It's going to be okay. So Paul exhorts the believers to continue in their faith. Don't let these opposers break you apart. Don't let them win by, you know, dividing up into factions. So he says in 2, 14 through 16, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. That's how you get through it. And this, Paul says, is going to be his boast that the people have remained faithful. Even if his life ends, he knows that these Philippians are capable of standing firm on the foundation that has been laid in Christ Jesus. And so Paul has some final words, a very specific exhortation for uh, the Philippians. And they concern two of his co-workers, Timothy, who we've heard about before, and Epaphroditus. So Timothy, he commends him to the people. He says, I'm sending them to connect with you, to check in on you, and to bring me back a report on how you're doing. And he's, you know, Timothy is trustworthy. He said, intimates that he's one of the only people that Paul trusts that he genuinely cares about people and Jesus. So he is sending his best to be with his friends in Philippi. Likewise, he talks about Epaphroditus, who was sent to Paul by the Philippians. And they sent him to help Paul. They, had, they sent him with gifts that probably were financial, maybe food, gifts of comfort to give to him while he was in prison. And, of course, to minister to Paul and just kind of be a friend to him 
and be alongside him. Now a note here, Paul's in prison, but it's not prison like you and I might think of in modern day times. It was more like house prison. He was allowed to have visitors. He, you know, was in relatively comfortable situation. He could have food brought to him. So it's not like he was in, uh, you know, a cell in the cold and dark where he wasn't getting fed and couldn't see anybody. So if they sent Epaphroditus, he would then have been able to stay with Paul. But, but what we find out is that Epaphroditus fell ill while he was there and that he actually almost died. And so Paul is anxious for his health. So he wants to send him back to Philippi. And he says when he does, he hopes that he will be greeted with joy and honor because Epaphroditus almost died for the work of Christ. Paul says he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And then as I was reading that verse over again, I said, well, that could sound really harsh. He risked his life to make up for the help that you couldn't give me. But I think we have to read it with more gentleness in his tone. I don't think Paul's condemning them. I just think, you know, he's realizing that obviously the whole Philippian church can't come to Rome to visit Paul in prison. So they sent a representative. And that's what he means by the, that verse. So then uh, we move to the third section, which is joy and unity, kind of how to move forward from this place. So Paul once again warns the Corinthians, or not the Corinthians, the Philippians to beware of their opponents, especially those Jewish missionaries. He says, by the way, their argument holds no water. If you want to talk about being a good Jew, I, Paul, was the best Jew, the best Pharisee ever. And he now says, I realize it was all worthless. It was garbage. I count it loss for the sake of Christ. It matters not that I was the best Jew because that is not how we receive the grace of God. So then he uh, gives them a little pep talk. And these are maybe my most favorite verses in the Bible. That's a hard thing to settle on. There's so much good, but I love these verses. And I have this scripture on the wall in my laundry room slash mudroom. When I come and go from my house, I see these verses. Uh, so let's read them. It's from Philippians 3, 10 through 14. So Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Oh, gives me chills even now, even though I've read it so many times. I love that verse. Press on. Forget what is behind. Move into what is ahead. Put off the, the present evil age. Live into the age to come. Figure out what it means to be in Christ and go for the goal. Aim for that prize. Run that race. And then everything you do will not be in vain. Your suffering will not be in vain. Your walk of faith will not be in vain and your hope will not be disappointed. So Paul says, follow me as far as I follow Christ, for many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And to this, he expresses his sorrow. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. And boy, can't we connect to those words, to all of Paul's words in this letter. This was thousands of years ago and it could have been written today. We still are besieged by people from within the church and people outside of the church who are opposing the genuine truth of the gospel. We, we still have to confront people who live as enemies of the cross of Christ and it is absolutely heartbreaking. It is sad and awful and it's something that we should be praying about. So he asks the Philippians, the ones he loves, he longs for and calls his joy and crown to stand firm and stand in unity. Do not let these opponents 
win. Do not let them undermine your confidence in Christ because you have every reason to be confident in Christ and confident in the life that you are are leading. So in closing, Paul once again takes us back to this theme of joy and he says, rejoice always. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What is he saying here? When you feel anxiety, stop, pray, ask God to come in, invite him in to make his presence manifest. Thank him for what he has done for you. And then he will give you his peace. Paul isn't saying he's going to fix it necessarily. He might not take you out of the situation that you're in. He might not immediately get rid of those opponents that you're facing, but he will give you peace. He will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You will be okay. So Paul again expresses his joy and thankfulness for the support of his friends even though he says, I have learned to not even really need it. And again, more great verses. Like you could underline this entire letter. It's so good. So he says he's learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. In 4, 12 through 14, he says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Amen. So good. I just want to stand up and cheer right now. Um, Such, such important words. So, of course, the overarching theme of this letter is joy. It's known as the letter of joy. But what we learn from Paul is that this isn't a feeling. This is not the same thing as what we might define as happiness. It's not a feeling. It's not a state of being. It is a settled state of mind characterized by peace, no matter the circumstance. And we can cultivate this. Paul viewed Christianity as a religion of joy just as much as a religion of grace. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I was doing the research for this uh, podcast episode. He saw Christianity as a religion of joy. I love that because I think I may have said this before. I don't know if it was to my discussion group or in this podcast, but when I was struggling with whether or not I really wanted to go all in with Jesus, whether I really wanted to be a Christian, I was in my early 20s and I just kind of pictured Christians as like, I don't know, like the pilgrims wearing long skirts and just kind of dour and not happy people, maybe a little bit boring. uh, I don't know, just like baking bread all the time or something. I don't know why I thought that. I didn't know anyone like that, but that was the image I had in my head. And we see that that's not the case. Christianity is about grace. Yes, it's about mercy and forgiveness. Absolutely. But it's also about joy. We can find joy. And of course, that's more than happiness. But it also means we can have fun. We can have a sense of humor. We can have personality. Uh, We don't have to be drab and colorless. Jesus and his disciples certainly were not. Paul certainly is not. And as we're seeing, the early church isn't. So we can be our truest selves as Christians. And I love that. Uh, So in fact, if you look at the Greek, the root word car is found in the cognates for joy, as well as the word grace. So the cognates for joy, kara, meaning inner joy, and karin, meaning to rejoice. And then the Greek word for grace is charis. So they are very closely linked, grace and joy. And so what Paul's saying is that God's grace, when we truly experience it and receive it, becomes a source of joy always. It becomes something that can give us that peace that passes all understanding, even when we're in the worst of circumstances. So for Paul, joy is a confidence that allows him to look at life through the lens of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is just it. That is what we are getting to. That's the maturity of faith we want to get to, where we see everything through the lens of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then we do have this sense of contentment, a wellness of peace, even, even in the darkest of nights. Joy allows us to see beyond our circumstances to the sovereign Lord who stands above all things and is working all things together for good. Joy celebrates the truth that Jesus Christ will come again and our lowly earthly bodies will be transformed, Paul says, to be like his glorious body and we will live with Christ in eternity. Y'all, I'm telling you, we're going to have sparkly bodies. I really believe that. (laughs) So this letter, in summary, speaks to the importance of supportive Christian friendships, to cultivating joy, to staying alert and aware of false teaching or people with nefarious purposes, and of course, of standing firm on the gospel. The Philippian church is, for Paul and for us, a shining example, stars in the sky, of what a small community can do to advance the kingdom of God. You help where and when possible with humility and kindness and compassion. You pray all the time and you help each other to find joy in every circumstance. So in terms of implications, let me say this. Paul here is not trying to insinuate that as Christians, we don't have bad days or bad moments or God forbid, bad years. He's not saying that we should never express sorrow or anger or disappointment. We are going to experience those things. We are human. We are dusty. We are limited. And we live in this present evil age. What he's saying is, We don't have to stay in those places. Just like we learned in the Psalms, where they would start a psalm off with lamenting and pouring out their hearts to God, sometimes cursing their enemies even, but it would end in a place of trust. I feel all these things. I'm in this terrible situation. I'm giving it to you, God, and I'm saying that I trust you. And that's what we want to do here. And we can do that even better than our Old Testament friends because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, because we know all this new revelation from Jesus Christ, because we know that there is a future beyond this broken world. And it's a good one. So what Paul is saying is when you're sorrowful, when you're anger, you have anger, when you're disappointed, when reality breaks in, It's okay to feel those things, but then keep pressing on. See the world through the lens of your faith in Jesus Christ. And do not let those things lead you to a, a pit of despair. Do not let those things rob you of your hope or your faith. Because if we cling to Jesus and we stand firm on the gospel truths, we can, my friends, we can do it. We can find genuine peace and contentment. I know this to be true. I know some of you. I know your stories. And I know that despite really terrible things and circumstances, you have expressed to me this sense of knowing that God is with you, this sense of peace. It doesn't mean that the hurt goes away right away, but you know that you are not alone and that God is with you. So this is what we can know. God is working all things together for good. Number two, Jesus Christ will set all things right at the end of days. God's justice will reign. Number three, we will get to live in eternity with Jesus in glorious, that's Paul's word, glorious bodies. I mean, if that's not sparkly, I don't know what is, where there will be no more crying or mourning or tears. Number four, we have the power of the Holy Spirit with us now to keep us safe and to guide us as we follow Jesus, and to help us find that peace and contentment, even in the midst of the imperfect world we are in. And number five, we are loved. We matter, and we are not alone. We can do this, my friends. We can press on. We can run the race set before us to win the prize, which is eternal life with our Lord, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for this letter, for this reminder of the joy that is possible through faith, even on the darkest of days, even on the most mundane, ordinary Monday, where maybe all we've done is 
go to work and come home or do laundry or clean up the house, do the dishes, the ordinary stuff of life. God, even in that, there can be this peace and contentment because we can see all through the lens of Jesus. So Father, help us to learn how to do that. Manifest that strength within us. Give us the strength so that like Paul, we can say, I have found a way to be content, whether in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. May that be our words. And so Lord, I now pray this for everyone listening. I pray with joy because of these friends who have journeyed with me through the Bible. And my prayer is that their love may abound more and more in knowledge of you and an insight into your word and to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I pray that you would help them to be able to discern what is best so they may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen and amen in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, friends, for joining me for this episode, and I will see you next week for the next group. We're going to be finishing up Paul's letters and then turning to the rest of the letters in the New Testament and then Revelation. So really not too many weeks left here in this study, but don't, don't despair. <laughs> have hope. See the world through the lens of Jesus. I will have additional offerings for us this summer. I just need to, I need to get through the bulk of creating all these new lectures and then I'll be able to think, but I think I have um, some material in mind and then I um, have some other interesting and exciting things that I'm going to do through my ministry. So looking forward to that. And thank you so much again for being a part of this. I will see you in the next episode.